Hello, everyone. Shout out in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Uh, welcome to Inside Out. Uh, this is Dovetail's webinar series where we gather product experts and our community together to inspire, challenge, and uh, learn about all the sort of cutting edge industry trends, the, the, the freshest tactics, the freshest thought leadership, and uh, wonderful guest Robin Zaragoza, product coach and founder and CEO of the Product Refinery. Uh, I've had a sneak peek at Robin's presentation, and I can guarantee you, you are all in for a treat. Uh, we will be covering uh, AI fundamentals to kick off, and then we'll move on to some actionable tactics uh, for getting an AI program off the ground at your company with all the considerations that go along with that. And finally, we'll end up on some leadership principles and guidelines for leading your organization into an era that is surely to be defined by artificial intelligence. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping up the top, we will have question, uh, time for questions at the end. So feel free to chuck everything that you want to know into the chat as it comes to mind. Or we also have the Q&A, uh, special Q&A box there. So you can uh, throw your questions in there. Colin and I will be attending to everything. So uh, sit back, relax, have a good time, ask questions. And I will let Robin take it away from here. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. Um, I can't see you, which is such a shame with digital stuff. Uh, um, I love seeing people's faces when I'm presenting, but uh, maybe claps if you're happy about something or I don't know, thumbs down if you're unhappy about something, just to give me a little bit of feedback. Um, so really happy to be here to talk about the, the world we're headed into, developing product with artificial intelligence. I have designed this talk <clears throat> with the mindset that perhaps, you know, obviously you've heard of it, you're here, so you've heard of it, um, but maybe you haven't started with it or you're just getting started. So there's something for everyone, but it's really about the early stages stuff. Um, and I've also tried to consider it from the standpoint of you might be at a startup or a small organization, or you might be at a very large organization. So the recommendations, the information I'm sharing apply mostly in both cases, but we can talk about the differences in the Q&A if you want. Um, so, um, oh, and another thing is that the way that I'm screen sharing, apologies in advance, it's gonna look a little fuzzy at first when it comes on and then it'll sharpen up. And there are a few slides that uh, uh, have very small text and you probably won't be able to read them, but Dovetail is gonna send out the deck afterwards and the information so you'll be able to see it later. And, and those details are usually not super important for the message anyway. So hello, my name is Robin Zaragoza. I'm a product coach and I'm also the founder of The Product Refinery, which is essentially a community of product coaches where folks like yourself, either individuals or companies come to find the right product coach for them. Uh, my timeline, and I'm really bad at building slides, so I'll just, you can see I didn't do a good job there. Um, my timeline and how I got to this place is I started out in the music industry managing rock bands. That is a conversation for another day. Uh, but I was very relieved when I moved into account management and marketing because my product, the thing that I was working with and selling didn't uh, talk back to me anymore. <laughs> um, and then I moved from account management and marketing because I was working at software companies into full-time product management and then product leadership. Uh, I have been able to have the experience of most kinds of exits. So uh, Mobile Lime uh, was a company that got merged with another one. Going was purchased by AOL. Uh, Viximo pivoted into a completely different business model. Uh, Plectix folded. And then of course, uh, TripAdvisor and eBay, very large organizations with you know a bit of red tape, uh, but a lot of good process and, and places to learn. So I feel very fortunate for the journey that I've had. And back in, um, it kind of says 2015, but I think it was more like 2016, I started consulting and coaching and I've worked with companies in, in most industries, uh, software, uh, no hardware stuff, but uh, analytics, uh, developer tools, e-commerce, insurance, you know, pretty much, pretty much every industry I've had a little bit of experience with either uh, doing the work, uh, helping the teams do the work, working with the leaders, et cetera. Um, so what I do want to say, though, is I am not an expert in AI, which is, is um, funny that I'm here today, but actually I think it's quite appropriate because uh, what I'm good at now as a product coach, having worked with so many companies, is I'm, I'm good at helping uh, 
individuals and teams upscale, uh, adopt new ways of working and look for opportunities with new technologies. So for example, last year I worked with IAG Loyalty and ran a, a, a very big workshop for them to help them figure out how they're gonna utilize virtual reality for their, their loyalty program. And I knew nothing about virtual reality before. So this was a really uh, exciting uh, talk for me to put together because obviously I had to get pretty deep into everything in order to share what's useful to you. So uh, what you're gonna get from this talk, uh, the first thing is, is AI right for us? And we'll talk about what is AI, what are the elements of it? So you can understand that, uh, how to get started with your first project. And then if you're a leader or if you're a senior product manager who's thinking about the leadership elements, how you actually uh, set it up for scaling successfully. So first question is, is AI right for us? And I could tell you all the statistics behind why AI is a good idea, the money being spent in, in the industry, the organizations adopting it. But for me, it's a very intuitive decision, right? These, since I started working in product management in 2004, this is a small list of all the technologies and trends that have come and stayed. And I've in my career had to figure out how to utilize a lot of these, these trends and technologies. And we don't even really talk about them anymore. I mean, personalization, for example, was a really big thing for a while. Who says we need to personalize stuff anymore? It's just how we develop product. So I do believe that AI is, is in that realm as well. It's just gonna become the norm of how we approach delivering value to our customers and to our business partners. So. My answer is yes, AI is right for you, 99.9%. .9%. Maybe there's some cases where it's not. And when I say right for you or for us, I mean it on two different levels. I think the first is learning for yourself what it is uh, and making it a skill set that you can talk about as you continue on in your current organization or as you look for new job opportunities in the next step. But then the second part is it's probably also right for your product and your company, at least in some way. So what is AI? This is an unofficial definition that I've, I've classified in my head, which is recreating human decisions or behavior with technology. And technology can mean software or hardware. And there are uh, many fields of AI. If you go and search for elements of AI or even ask ChatGPT, like it, at least 20, 30, 40 different elements and subtypes of, of AI get listed. But these are the most prevalent. So machine learning, which we're going to talk a lot about a little bit more uh, and some examples as well, as well. Netflix recommendations uses machine learning. Natural language processing, which is what Google Translate uses. Computer vision, speech re recognition, robotics, and symbolic reasoning. This last one is quite interesting because when I was looking through the different types of, of AI, symbolic reasoning has been around for a really long time. It is essentially the expert systems that we use with logic. So it's the, the processing and manipulation of symbols or even concepts rather than numerical data. And it's a lot of the if then statements. So when we were first developing algorithms for our software decades ago, we would put in rules that said, if this happens, then that happens. So actually AI has been around a really long time. It's just a, a, a new evolution today. Um, so what I also want to talk about is the fact that when you hear AI spoken about, artificial intelligence and machine learning, they're, they're not the same thing, but they are often used synonymously. And that is because machine learning as a type of artificial intelligence is one of the most prevalent in software. Um, and we'll look at uh, how machine learning works in just a minute, a, a quick um, review of it. Another term you may hear used is deep learning. This is, or if you're familiar with neural uh, networks, that's also kind of the same thing. Um, that is a, a, a type of machine learning. So when you hear someone say machine learning, they do mean artificial intelligence. Um, but as, as you look back at this, there's other types of artificial intelligence as well. 
And machine learning is essentially um, teaching a machine what to do with information. There's three main types of machine learning. There's supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. A lot of the stuff that we're used to seeing is supervised learning, and that is essentially structured data sets. The data is labeled and you give it to an algorithm and it pops out some information based on what you've asked it to, to pop out. So um, classification is one of the types of supervised learning or regression. So any kind of forecasting you might see, uh, whether that's um, behavior in the markets, uh, in the financial industry, or weather forecasting, <laughs> the weatherman in London is always wrong. So I think his software needs a little bit of an update. Um, those would be examples of supervised learning, as would be classification. So we're, we're looking at sets of data and trying to understand, is it this or is it that? That's also supervised learning. When you have unstructured data, that's when you would typically use unsupervised learning. And that's essentially you give the algorithm a bunch of information and it finds the patterns for you. And then you decide, are those the right patterns? And then you can revise it after that to, to figure out if that's the way that you want things grouped. So uh, targeted marketing is a really good example. HubSpot does a great job of, of grouping customers by, by certain elements. So that's, uh, that's all around clustering. And then the last element of machine learning is reinforcement learning. And that's essentially where you kind of let the algorithm do what it's gonna do initially. You give it some, um, uh, some goals that you have in mind and it's constantly trying to optimize to reach those goals, but you are also feeding it with information and correcting it as you go along. With all types of machine learning, this is a simplified view, but it's essentially data, you have an input and you have an output. So you're giving it the input, it's doing a bunch of things with the algorithm and it's giving you an output. So a very simple example is you give it a photo of a, a cat and then you ask the algorithm, is this a cat? Yes or no, right? And this is math um, because, or numbers rather, uh, because every pixel in this image actually can be associated with a unique number. So the algorithm learns to identify that certain pixels and numbers together in certain combinations equals a cat. So some examples of inputs and outputs and the applications that they might have in machine learning. So you've got spam filtering and the input there is the whole email. And then the output is, is it spam or is it not spam? So does it go in the inbox or does it get deleted for you? Um, for audio, you can uh, recognize the speech and the output of that is a text transcript. Uh, you have translation, English to Chinese. So you can see um, a lot of the stuff that we're used to using in software is machine learning, even though there's tons of other types of AI out there. Um, but this concept of you know, input and output, especially when you're getting down into um, neural networks, it, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, so it's not as simple as, as what I put on the slide, um, but the real magic in AI comes from the combination of different steps in the process or different algorithms or different inputs and outputs that build upon each other. So here is an example of Alexa or Siri or whatever you might use for your, um, for your voice assistant, right? So if you're saying, hey Siri, or hey Google, I don't know what the other ones use, um, there's a trigger word that the software is, is listening for, right? And then there's a speech recognition. What did they say? Then what does that mean? Um, and then as you can see, step four is, is no really not, um, it's not AI anymore, it's just normal software. Once the software understands, okay, it wants a timer, it wants it set for 10 minutes, then it's just normal software engineering, right? And you build in the timer. So the combination of all these different technologies is what actually makes it mimic human behavior. Uh, and everything we've been talking about is really about data, it's about numbers, it's about math. So AI is good at recognizable patterns or predictable decisions, but it's not so good at critical thinking. So if a human, if you can break down a process or a job that you're looking at applying AI to, if you can break that down into individual tasks, and each one of those tasks a human could do in a second 
and you'd have your colleague agree with how you did that, then it's probably a good candidate for AI. If it takes a long time as a human to make a decision on one small task, or you, you wouldn't necessarily have the same opinion as your colleague, that's critical thinking and AI is not so good for that because there's too many assumptions or priorities that are not as easy, easy to code. So when you're thinking about what might be right for your organization and where your opportunities might come from, these are the most common use cases for AI. Um, so hiring, organizations have used it to go through CVs. Now there's there was a little um, hoopla a little bit with, I think it was Amazon and their hiring and how there was bias built into their system. So you do have to be careful of that and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but in education, there's, uh, there's a use case where some of the online educators are starting to use uh, facial recognition to understand the sentiment of the learners and whether they're confused or they're understanding. And that would then feed back into, do you continue on with the same topic? Do you go a little bit deeper? Do you move on? Energy management, uh, fascinating how Google actually uses its own AI to manage how much energy is being used, how many processors are being turned on and turned off at any point of the day based on how much um, load they have. So lots of different opportunities. I think personally, uh, one of the best places to start is looking at some of your internal systems and creating efficiency within the organization because there are so many places that we as humans are highly skilled and using our time for things that's probably not, uh, not so great for the organization. So that's, I think also efficiency is maybe something I should put on here, something for you to think about. Okay, so we talked about if AI is right for you, chances are yes. We've talked about very high level how it works. Um, now you're thinking, okay, I I'm ready. I see something in here that makes sense to me that I wanna get going with. How do you get started? Okay, so how to get started successfully. And I say successfully because as I was starting to do my research for the talk, I talked to a lot of product managers who were currently managing AI products. Some of them were integrating existing open source technologies. Some of them were using um, data sources that were available elsewhere. Some of them were building from scratch. And I heard again and again that it was really easy to start, but very difficult to get the continued support, right? So what I'm suggesting here is uh, what most of them uh, said would work well for them if they could go back and do it again. So the first thing is to play and understand what is possible. Um, the second is to do a little bit of a deep dive and learn the technologies in more detail. The third is to test and run uh, a pilot project or a proof of concept. And then the fourth is to communicate and make a case. And you can see here, here I'm making the assumption that you haven't been given the directive by your manager or by your organization to start with AI. If you have, great, I would still recommend going with this. But that last one, if you wanna do a little bit of a test and then make a case, it's really important that you do each of these. So in terms of playing, obviously ChatGPT is something that you can play with um, and you can use that in a lot of different ways as a product manager or a product designer. If you just search um, AI use cases for product managers or um, ChatGPT prompts for product managers, you'll find so many great suggestions. Uh, then there's some other software that I recommend that you can use free or very low cost that probably fit into things you're already doing as a product manager or a product designer. Uh, the first is Collado. So this is uh, AI used for document search and summarizing information in there, which can be really great if you're thinking about product marketing and oh, what do we, where do we need to uh, update our documentation, can use it for user research as well. Uh, Jam is great for debugging. So, you know, if you've got a really busy development team and you're one of those product managers or product owners or product designers that has to flag bugs and kind of tell them uh, what it should do instead, this software will help you understand why something is buggy and, and what possible routes to correction are. TLDB, I don't actually even know what that stands for, but it's one of the many 
meeting transcription services out there, but it also has really good summarization, which some of them don't. This next one, I have forgotten the name of it. Sh ship Shipyard, I think maybe. Uh, that is image generation. It's similar to Dolly, but uh, it's pretty robust. And I think it's easier to use as well. And then last is Monkey Learn. This is great for the product designers. This is cleaning up and labeling customer feedback from really any system that you have. So all of these have an element of AI. Your data analytics software, if you're using Mixpanel or Amplitude or any of those, most of those have elements of AI built in as well. If you're not trying them yet, get in there and try them. You'll start to understand how, one, the quality of data is important, but two, how you as a user interact with it and sometimes how frustrating it is, which I think is very important that empathy is very important to designing solutions in your own software. Uh, the next, this is probably one of the ones is a bit fuzzy by the way. Uh, the next step is to learn. So don't get started with an AI project until you have a baseline of knowledge. I'm doing a whistle stop tour today. 45 minutes is definitely not enough to get you, get you all sorted. So here are some of the best resources that I found. Uh, this AI for everyone, 100% must take, just gives you a big broad overview. It does focus in on machine learning rather than larger AI, but I, I think that's okay because a lot of use cases that we're working with today, machine learning is the place to start and it's free. Uh, I'm gonna butcher his name, but I think it's Andrew Ng. He is one of the uh, mavericks in the space of AI. He's been working on it for, for at least 20 years. He's been at Google and a bunch of the other organizations that have used it. Um, he's, he's really fantastic. And even though I think he's a data scientist initially or originally, uh, he really breaks things down very easily to understand. Uh, there's a couple of paid options. Udacity has a product management nano degree for AI. Uh, Duke University with Coursera has one. Uh, LinkedIn Learning, which if you or organization pays for, it's just free. But I just say 45 a month or 40 a month in case you don't have it. And there's tons of tiny little ones, like just a couple of hours. They actually have a nice little leadership one in there as well, leading AI teams. Um, Machine learning crash course. If you can code a little bit, uh, specifically, I think Python is, is the language that's most appropriate, uh, then that would probably be a good one. If there's one other I've, I've tried out that I can't remember the name of it, maybe I'll figure it out and put it in the deck. Uh, but if you can code and you can start to, you know, one, look at data and clean up the data, and then two, start to train a model. And there are open source solutions for training models when you're not necessarily an engineer. TensorFlow is one of them. Uh, that's really great. And then the last one is this Geeks for Geeks deep learning tutorial. This for me is more of a go-to when I'm like, oh, what's that concept? How does it work again? It does have a, a project that you can build through it. Um, but I use it more as a dictionary to help me understand some of the, the concepts of, of deep learning, which is an, uh, a subtype of machine learning, but very popular as well. Okay, now that you have played around, you understand what's out there, how it works, you've learned a little bit, the next is to run a pilot project. So the point of the pro pilot project is not to add value to the organization yet. The point of the pilot project is to have success in whatever outcome that you define. Make it super, super, super small. Make sure you document your learnings. If possible, work on something where it has visual results because that makes it easier if you're non-technical to validate whether the data and the model are working as expected. It's a little bit harder if you're working with algorithms that spit out more data that you can't quite understand or visualize on your own. Because starting small could also mean you as a product manager directly with an engineer or you as a product manager with a designer and an engineer, it doesn't have to be a big team. And I would, when I say start small, I mean, you know, a couple days, a couple weeks max, like super, super small. This is, when you search for what is the AI product development lifecycle, you'll get many different uh, images. This is one I picked, uh, but essentially the process looks like you collect the data, you clean up the data, you train the model on the data, then you have to test, 
then you have to, you know, fix it, optimize it, and then you deploy it. Now, what I didn't like about a lot of these models about the process of building AI or building machine learning algorithms is that they all kind of stop with the, you know, deploy it and then monitor and optimize. And I think one of the most important parts here is that these algorithms often behave in ways that we don't expect when they're presented with information that wasn't expected. And what that means is users can be very confusing and very frustrated. So this is where I think UX, UR, just any kind of product design is super important. Lots of user testing and also lots of user training because sometimes it requires behavior change from users as well. If they're used to doing a bunch of steps on their own and all of a sudden you're doing it for them and then you expect them to trust that it did the thing that they wanted it to do, but they can't actually see it. You can imagine that that could be very um, nerve wracking for a customer. So I, I do think product uh, design, user research, super important here. So I think I need to make my own uh, model process that includes that as well. If you're getting started, here are some of the skills that you're gonna need on the team that's working on it. So as you saw before with the Siri Alexa example, it was a combination of AI technologies and just normal software. So you will probably need normal software engineering skills. Then you will need some kind of machine engineering skills. Those uh, can be your software engineer if you're starting out small. Like I said, there's a lot of training programs out there. There's some great ones for software engineers who want to upskill in this area. So if you've got someone who's interested in going that direction, work with them. You'll also need somebody to be uh, cleaning up the data and figuring out how to store the data if you're using your own data. And that can be a data engineer if you've got them on your team. Many teams do not have them. So maybe a data scientist could be good here. Or if you're a technical product manager, you could take on that role as well. You do need some product management to figure out what to, what to build, for whom, why, sort of all the normal business decisions that go along with building software. And then, like I said, it's very important to have user experience and research. And once you've actually uh, completed your project, then one, you want to communicate the outcomes that you created, but you want to also explain what did you learn about the data, the process, the team skills. So sometimes if you're using a public source of data, it might not be right for you. Or if you're using internal data, you might have discovered we don't need as much data as, as we thought we did. So this is easier than we thought. Uh, process, maybe the way that you're normally developing software doesn't work anymore because there's so much work required in data cleanup, for example. Uh, team skills, when you tried the project out, did you have the right skills? Do you need to upskill different parts of the organization? All of these things are gonna help create trust in your executive team if you want to go to them and make a case. You've started to understand what does it take to actually build AI expertise within an organization. Okay, now you've done your test project, you've got a little support. How do you go about finding a good area for AI to scale? So all the normal stuff around, it has business value, it has customer value, however, however you choose to measure those things. It does need to be well suited to AI. Executive, executive teams are not necessarily trained yet in AI. So understanding that concept of individual tasks that take a human one second to do, they may not realize what is possible with AI. So making sure that it, it, it fits in that criteria. The data needs to be either available already to you or it needs to be accessible. And when I say accessible here, it might mean that you need budget to go out and purchase some data sets, or it might need, mean that you have some kind of legal uh, arrangement for a partnership to share data with another organization who's, uh, who's a good partner. So that has to be available. And then you have to have the skills as well on the team, in-source or outsourced, early stage companies, uh, sorry, early stage products, very often you can outsource some of this stuff. Bonus on top of those things, if you pick something that can be applied to multiple problems, so a single algorithm that's, um, let's say, clustering, if you learn how to cluster one 
uh, set of data for one specific type of criteria, could you use that clustering algorithm elsewhere? And that means that you're already starting to think about long-term scale. And then the last bit is that ideally long-term, you may not get there in the short term, you want to have data sets that create a virtuous cycle. So what that means, if you haven't heard of a virtuous cycle before, it's essentially that um, getting the data into your system creates better outcomes for customers, which makes them want to use your product more, which then means that they are willing to share more data with you or use your product, creates more data. And eventually, this is how you build defensibility into your software, because it's very hard to recreate that. Okay, so final section, leading an AI team. So your role as a product leader when you're building an AI team looks very much the same. You still have strategy, you still have communication. Some of the things that are new are there's change management. The process for the team is going to be new and different. You're gonna to have to upskill and train, maybe hire differently. There'll be different risks, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the strategy becomes not just product strategy now, and I'll show you in a minute some of the elements that are new that you need, need to start thinking about and collaborating with other leaders. Uh, and always you need executive support, but it's even more important here. So this was a quote from a long uh, HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review piece. I was kind of shocked by this. It said that 67% of CEOs prefer to make decisions based on intuition and experience over insights generated through data analytics. So if they're not willing to trust data analytics, AI is even more of a stretch. And that was uh, data that was found across many different surveys with many different big consulting companies. That's gonna make it an uphill battle for your team if you have not secured that uh, executive support. So, how do you build that trust in the data and AI? The first is that you know you want to make sure that you've got reliable models and algorithms that are built and there are consistent insights. You don't wanna be putting things in front of them where everything's changing all the time and they don't feel like they can trust it. You wanna make sure that you're av avoiding bias in your AI, that it's ethical and moral. And then most importantly, you have to have explainability, which is you have to be able to explain what it's doing, how it's doing it, why it's doing it that way, the decisions that you made, how you uh, cleaned up the data, how you trained the data and the model in order to create those outcomes and even be able to live show them, okay, if we change it this way, here's what we get. So they start to build that trust that it is reliable and it is consistent. So going back to the bias part of that, um, this is a quote from somewhere. I forgot to capture exactly where, sorry about that. But AI bias is underlying prejudice and data that's used to create AI algorithms, which can ultimately result in discrimination or other social consequences. So why does this happen? This happens because the data that you're using contains human decisions instead of things that are uh, objective and straightforward. Um, it might be that the data you're using is based on historical in inequalities across organizations or societies. It might be that you're under or over sampling from a specific data set so that when you're using it, you're not getting uh, a view of other data sets. If, you're, if you've got user-generated content that your AI is built on top of, of course, that's going to have bias according to the audience that creates that content. And then also sometimes, especially when you've got unstructured data and you are letting the data sort of figure out where the patterns are, there might be correlations that the algorithm sees and that might actually be there, but don't mean something or they're unacceptable or they're illegal. So these are all types of biases you need to keep in the back of your mind. Essentially, if race, gender, socioeconomic uh, situations or political situations are oversubscribed in your, in your data set or in your outputs, you need to be thinking about how do we correct for those things. I will not go to the next slide. There we go. Okay, so just one of many, many, many examples of bias being built in. This is an image 
uh, of something called Project Greenlight in Detroit. So it's a surveillance program that was created in 2016 and high definition cameras were put all throughout the city of Detroit. This, this data streams to the police department and can be tested for facial recognition against criminal databases, driver's license, state ID photos, and all those things, 100% of the population is captured in there, right? The driver's license, they have all that data for every single person who drives. But if you look at the left-hand side, this is where the cameras are. If you look at the right-hand side, this is the ethnic population that is represented in Detroit. Where are the cameras? You know, they're pretty much in the neighborhoods with Blacks. So what does that mean? That means that that part of society is being oversubscribed in a criminal database. That doesn't seem very fair to me. And that can lead to a lot of impact on things like social housing, on uh, arrests, on unemployment. So the idea of this, I'm not sure if I agree with it anyway. This is a... Um, it's one of those things that, that there isn't a lot of agreement on, but you can see AI bias becomes a real issue if you're not thinking about how you're using it. So how do we reduce bias? Uh, one, we use less bias data, pretty straightforward. Uh, the second is to make sure you're building in explainability. It's a black box sometimes, these algorithms, so make sure that you have ways to understand what it's doing and how it's doing it. Be testing on real world examples. So very often when we're building this stuff, we start off with test data, which is helpful to start with, but eventually that's not representative of the real world. So you eventually want to move on to testing on real data to understand where has this gone wrong. Auditing processes, making sure you're checking for things that could likely go wrong. Putting in constraints to fix some of these biases, either fixing it on the data side or fixing it on the output side. Having human judgment on top of the data is very important. And then diversity in the team. And that's something we talk about in product management all the time. The more diverse the team, the better solution we're gonna get for our, our product and for our customers because we're thinking about things from all different angles. And that means diversity in roles that are involved, diversity in uh, ethnicities, diversity, in really any kind of opinion. So moving on to um, AI strategy and what that looks like for uh, product leaders, a lot of things are the same. So you're still going to be thinking about how are we going to use this technology for different goals that the organization has and the different use cases that our customers have or our internal customers have or our stakeholders. Um, you're going to be thinking about skills and resourcing. You're going to be thinking about performance metrics, feedback and iteration. But there's a couple of new things in here as well. And those are the things that are highlighted in green. Uh, so you need to be thinking about data strategy. Where are we getting the data from? How are we, get, how are we getting it? How are we cleaning it up and, and, and fixing it and storing it in, uh, in a scalable way? And these are elements where you would be collaborating very closely on whoever oversees your data infrastructure. Maybe that's your CTO or a, a VP level. You need to start thinking about ethical and legal, right? So you will be partnering with the legal team on that kind of stuff. You'll need to think about technology and infrastructure. Again, partnering with a, a VP or a CTO. Integration and deployment. So all of a sudden you have a very different technology that you, you need to figure out how does that fit into the cycle of how we release software? What do we need to do from a, um, a marketing perspective? What do we need to do from a customer service and su support perspective? So a lot of things are gonna have to change. And then number nine is change management. If you've never actually changed the way an organization works, this is probably one of those areas that as you move through, you're gonna have to do. Um, integrating AI over the long term, there's this really great book on the left hand side um, that I recommend reading, um, Human and Machine, uh, I can't read the words, we'll send it around. Um, essentially, you need to think about how the things that AI is good at that you can replace what you're doing as humans and the things that humans are good at. So again, the subjective stuff, the critical thinking, 
the emotions, all that kind of stuff needs to stay human activities, but there's plenty of things that are just quick and routine um, that machines can do for us. So this is just a quick little view of thinking about different areas of your business that might apply. Uh, okay, so team organization, that is definitely one of the things that might have to be a little different here as well. As you saw earlier, there are some different roles that are involved in AI projects that you might not have uh, on your your day to day scrum teams if you're using agile or scrum. For example, data science is very often a service within the organization that everybody goes to rather than integrated in the team. But actually, when you're thinking about AI, you might actually need a data scientist that is there on the project team. Uh, this is a visual from I think it's another HBR HBR article. And they surveyed hundreds of organizations, very large ones, on how they were setting up their teams for success. And the common theme is that there's a hub and spoke model, which is possibly not unsimilar to what you're doing right now, which is your hub is where all your, um, your strategy is being decided and all the things that might apply across different, um, uh, different decisions. So this is where upskilling and recruiting would apply across the board. Um, legal might acro apply across the board. Um, data infrastructure might apply across the board. So you might not need those things on each individual team. Um, and then the spokes are the ones that are actually building. And then there's this gray area in, in the middle. Um, just some organizations will have the hub doing it. Some will have the spoke doing it. My personal approach to finding new ways of working is to find the simplest, most straightforward answer first and see if that works. So however you are working today, I'd recommend seeing if you can make it work the way it is. And then if that's not working, then you can figure out how to change it. Um, from the AI for everyone training, one of the interesting parts uh, that Andrew talks about, because he's worked on many of these projects across organizations, is the order in which you would try to transform the organization. And I thought it was interesting that developing an AI strategy is number four. And I guess it goes a little bit back to, you really need to understand what is possible and how it applies to your organization before you can start to come up with an AI strategy. So as a leader, creating the space for pilot projects is your number one priority if they're not doing anything yet. Then building the team, whether that's in source or outsourced, then making sure that there's training for everyone so that they understand. And when I say training, I don't just mean for the teams that are developing the software. Everybody is gonna to have to understand how this stuff works in order to do their jobs better. So partnering with your HR team to figure out the right training based on the role that someone has and how they're gonna engage with the software. Uh, developing the training and then uh, having the communication as last. So um, some summary and tips overall across both building uh, some AI or leading a team. One, AI can't do everything. Make sure that what you're thinking about or what your executives are thinking about apply to what is possible. Explainability is very hard. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to it, building it in, have lots of user research, lots of user training as part of your process. You need to constantly monitor and optimize your machine learning algorithms or your AI. And that's because very often the data sets coming in do not stay the same. If you create that virtuous cycle, you're gonna have more and more data flowing in, which means you're gonna have new aspects of that data that you need to think about what to do with. So if you're in an organization where you ship it and forget about it, that's gonna be a major change to the way the organization operates. If you are at a company or on a team that is considered a, a feature team, and there's nothing wrong with that, sometimes that's necessary. Uh, if your team doesn't think in outcomes, if your organization doesn't think in outcomes, starting with AI before you think in outcomes is going to be an uphill battle. So I, I don't recommend doing that because you're not necessarily trying to create the feature, you're trying to create um, the outcome with the data, and you can't always predict how that's going to turn out. And then uh, again, starting small and not getting ahead of yourself. As you're starting out, 
think about buying or partnering for either uh, the, the algorithms themselves, there's lots of stuff open source or the data sets. And then my final thing just to share with you is that I'm not all the way through, but I've read most of it. This book called Genius Makers is not required reading. It's not gonna help you understand AI any better, but it's kind of the history of the people that have brought AI to the software world. It's incredible how long they've been working on this, like decades. It's taken a really long time. And there's a couple of very funny characters. I can't remember his name, but one of them, he doesn't um, he doesn't sit down because he's got a back issue. So he was in this moment of being uh, hired by multiple companies. And in order to get him to some meetings, he took trains and he stood or hit a sleeper car, but also private jets to get him there. Like he's he's a really funny character. The the writer here, um, Cad Metz, he's just brilliant and at making this story of, of AI come to life. So that is it. Thank you very much. Um, if you we're gonna do Q and A now, but if you do want to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just my name, Robin Zaragoza. Um, if you want to work with me or one of our other coaches, theproductrefinery.com. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robin. Everybody, uh, a digital round of applause is in order. Um, so send your love as, as much as possible. We'd love to see those emojis flying. Um, thank you so much, Robin. That was incredibly insightful, uh, wonderful presentation. We have a lot of awesome questions. Uh, uh, Daniela, a lot of people are raising their hands. Uh, we just encourage you to chuck your, or to throw, chuck, very Australian here, but if you can throw your questions into the Q&A, we will attend every single one that we possibly can. Uh, I am going to just jump straight into some questions. As I said, we've had a lot of great things come through. Uh, so uh, some some security concerns we've had, Robin. Um, so from both Veronica and from Soma, uh, we have questions about uh, security when using open source AI, and um, it's a similar in a similar vein. AI, like other tools, has issues with ethics and regulations. Uh, I think this was pertaining to like who should be on an AI team. Won't an important role be in ethics or regulatory? Uh, someone in, in in that sort of discipline. So uh, let's talk about security, ethics, and regulatory compliance, uh, Robin. Um, thoughts on sure. okay. open source AI? Yeah. Yeah. So on the security side, um, yes, that is very much an issue. There's no easy answer, but I would say that there's a, there's a couple things to think about. One, if you are in a regulated industry, open source is, you know, probably not a good idea, especially when you're talking about, um, people's money or people's data. That's where, it's easier to start with open source stuff because it's faster and you learn faster, but you might not be able to do it. So agree, that's a trade-off you have to make. Um, or you just use uh, the open source stuff for the low risk things and you have to build in mitigation plans. What happens if, if the software gets hacked? What happens if it goes down? So any kind of... Um, you know, a mitigation plan that you would normally do with something that's high risk in your product, you would do the same for AI. Um, when you're starting out with your very first project, like I said, just pick something where this is not a concern at all, because that the point is not to build the value yet. Um, on the ethics and regulations, um, yes, it's an important role, but I don't, in looking at the way that teams are organized, I didn't see those folks being on the product team. And I think that's because the process of considering the ethics, um, contracts and negotiation, all that kind of stuff is more broad based applies across multiple projects versus individual products. So I think we, we need to be looking at the legal team as very close partners where, whereas there's been a couple of situations where I've had to work with the legal team on things and I'm really bad at this. I tell them at the last minute and they kind of make do and they figure out how to make it work for me, but you can't in this situ situation. So it probably does mean also getting them in early and often having them at major reviews so they can have those checkpoints to, to steer you in a different direction or do the research that they need to do. Um, but I don't think that they need to be on the product team. You are muted, Sean. 
I am muted. Thank you very much for that response, Robin. Uh, I mm -hmm. do notice that we've got a lot of questions about Dovetail, like how does Dovetail come into play? How should we feedback our AI needs, AI requests to service providers like Dovetail, like ourselves? And uh, another question about uh, how I, uh, analyzing data from Dovetail with AI. Um, so of course, uh, Dovetail is working really hard on AI solutions at the moment. We have introduced summarization. We've also introduced some thematic clustering uh, for your uh, uh, for the data that you've already tagged. However, we do have a really exciting announcement towards the end of this year where we we are working hard on a product that uh, will integrate AI in a much more holistic sense. So uh, stay tuned. Um, in the meantime, uh, you can send your feedback requests and you can send uh, any ideas that you might have. Uh, to our normal feedback channels for our support or in in products. Uh, and next question that we have um, from from the Q and A. Uh, so uh, someone was mentioning that they were talking to a data scientist, and I think this refers back to explaining AI to an executive. Uh, they they said that uh, model explain explainability is is difficult and can't always be done. I think this refers to kind of the idea that AI is a bit of a black box. Um, so like, how would you go about uh, communicating the effectiveness of AI to an executive who, when, you know, you can't always explain what the inner, into sort of the mechanisms involved are? So if explainability is not always possible, I think um, displaying what it can do and showing them all the different use cases and the reliability across all those use cases is, is very important. So if you can't, well, uh, one, I think explaining the technology to them itself, especially when you're talking about neural networks, it, it gets really complicated. I would take the time and encourage them as much as you can, because it's a senior executive, that they should take the training as well to understand those things. But then after that, find, um, you know, three of the most important use cases where the technology is used and do demos, constantly be doing demos and also constantly be um, communicating when you had to change things because new information came in and the algorithm did something unexpected and oh, constantly letting them know that you are monitoring as well as fixing. And where there are things that go wrong, communicate that really often as well because they need to know that you are, are making the right decisions in, in their absence. So yeah, I get you can't always provide explainability, but I think you can still build that trust. You're really good at the new- I'll mute again, I'm a mute. Sorry, last time that'll happen. Um, uh, a question here from Cat Fox. I, a, a lot of commercial companies don't have embedded teams. Uh, so how can a team work effectively with AI if, uh, if it is out, is it at something that you outsource or is it something that you should consider outside of the team? Uh, I think we did touch on this in the presentation, but uh, it's probably worth going over one more time. Yeah, so if you have an outsourced team, uh, you know, they're gonna be doing software engineering presumably already. And I guess the question is, what do you do with the AI portions? I think it depends on what you're starting with. If you're, if you're starting with internal users and creating better efficiency for them, um, maybe it's okay to outsource that uh, to your, your development partner um, because maybe the things that they're doing, especially if they're using open source technologies, because you're not building any real um, uh, defensibility in that case. You're not building anything that's sort of proprietary to your organization. Um, but if you're doing, if you're working on something that is critical for the users, is very high impact, I would try to have the AI aspects, the data aspects be internal and then partner with your with your outsource team to help them understand the integration between AI and, and normal software. And, and that might mean you have a slightly choppier, more waterfall type process. It might not be as agile. You know what? That's okay sometimes as well. Uh, we have a question here uh, about. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, we have a question here about uh, leveraging AI for user research specifically. Um, so, uh, do you know any sort of cases where uh, people have leveraged AI for user research specifically? 
I think there's a lot of development and you would know about this, Sean, you're probably do, better yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. situated to answer, but there's a lot on, in terms of the summarization and the synthesis of, of data and, and user research and the organization of the data as well. Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave that to you. To answer. Yeah. I think, I think when it comes to user research and using AI, there's obviously a fair bit of uh, gray area or at least uh, like there's a comfortable discomfort with using out like outside like tools like ChatGPT where we have to put in our participant data or other otherwise private PII. Um, so I think we're at the stage now where we're trying to figure out uh, how we can use AI. However, there aren't many suitable tools that allow for the use of AI. Um, my opinion, obviously, the opinion of Dovetail and the organization that I work for is that. Uh, like generative AI or large language models are somewhat akin to going from an abacus to a calculator when it comes to being able to process like large volumes of text data. So that qual data where, you know, you've got spreadsheets and calculators and everything that can process numerical data. We now have the ability to process a large amount of uh, qualitative data. So we are really, really excited about that potential. And we think this is a massive boon for the industry uh, and for the profession and is set to transform um, the, the craft in in uh, pretty much every conceivable way. So we're very, very excited about, excited about, uh, uh, about where that might lead. And like, as I said, we do have some big product developments coming towards the end of the year uh, that touch on, on some of these themes. Um, Hey, just just to comment on that in that particular space, like we still have the same problem that we've we've always had, right? Which is what data is important to us to look at, and is the clustering of that data useful for the question that we're asking? Like those are human decisions; those are critical thinking decisions. Um, so I love AI because it speeds up the whole process. Like trying to go through Excel spreadsheets from interviews, it's like, that's awful. But at the end of the day, you still need to be making decisions with your colleagues to say, you know, the way that this has been clustered, does that make sense to us? We wanna move things around. Do we, do we say that the data itself can only be sorted into one bucket and therefore all of the insights around that thing only get associated with that one question or can the data go into multiple buckets, right? Um, so, so definitely like there's a, I think user research in particular is one where machine learning and humans have to work really closely together. Couldn't agree more. I think the idea of understanding other humans is a human task and um, AI will hopefully replace a lot of that sort of manual, uh, like the idea of tagging, I personally believe is going to be something uh, that won't happen in the future because that is the manual part. Uh, so we can actually spend more time focusing on solving customer problems and less time sifting through data and processing large volumes of data. So that's that's what, where I see AI really coming up. Uh, we're, we're heading towards the end of the, uh, the session. So I just want to uh, drop a few links here. So for anybody who loved this session and wants to see more, uh, do subscribe to our newsletter, the Outlier newsletter. Um, so there's a link there. Uh, second uh, link is for our Slack user group. So if you enjoy this conversation, uh, definitely stick around uh, and jump into the Slack. Very active. A lot of people go out on there to discuss. And obviously, finally, uh, if you aren't already a Dovetail customer or you are no longer a Dovetail customer, definitely jump in and try for free. We have a lot of AI features already. And like I said, there are more coming in the future. If you're a product manager, for example, uh, we really think uh, Dovetail is awesome for you. Uh, it gives you a very structured approach to research. Uh, it also allows you to be as lean or as rigorous as you like. Uh, it it's allows you to take what you already know about the customer, that that gut feel, that intuition that you have, and leverage it and share it with your whole team to ensure that you're all aligned. Uh, so uh, that's that's the final pitch from me. Um, I want to just do one more thank you for Robin, our lovely guest, uh, for Colin here for helping us out on the chat, and for you all, our amazing audience from Europe. I assure you, uh, after today, uh, after seeing all the great comments and all the amazing participation, I would love to do more of this. So we will definitely be planning more events for our European audience in this time zone. Um, so stay tuned, subscribe to the newsletter, and we will be back for more soon. See you all soon.